On one of the trips uh, to Viva Las Vegas, like the fourth or fifth one, we're, we're driving across the desert at dawn, my wife and I, and I start feeling a wobble in the rear, and I look at her, luckily it wobbled first, and, I, and we're going 75, and the whole club's behind me, and big rigs to my right. I said, honey, I think we have a flat, hold on. So I let out of the gas, it slows down pretty quick, Right about then, there's a huge, hugest boom. The rear right wheel flies off, and <laughs> the whole car dumps back. It's on its, it's braking now and skidding down the highway. She looks, the wheel goes by us. She says, holy shit, there goes the wheel, and it's ahead of me now. I look over my shoulder, there's a big rig barreling down on us. We come to, we slow down and come to a stop within, you know, on the side of the road, and I, I, I get out of the car, and we didn't, I thought we were going to roll the car. We get out of the car and the traffic is back in, a, in 30 seconds. There's a hundred cars behind us and luckily we scooch it off the road and uh, the wife earns her points and goes out in the desert and gets my wheel. And, uh This car sat um, sat there all weekend. A lot of people were interested in buying it. Uh, the price I thought was fair, but it was it was not free. You know, it was it was up there, and so I I literally watched the car go away on a trailer, um, chomping at the bit. You know, uh, to uh, I knew I, I knew I wanted it. I knew I wanted it. The car left. I got the, had his guy's phone number. I knew where he lived. He lived on the way home from that event. I'm I I got on the phone. Next thing I remember, Vern and I, him and his 40, me and my 41, hightailing down, uh, down the 99 and then the 5. I knew somebody was going to call these guys and buy the car. I just, I said, man, I, I, we got to get to this guy's house. So we're pounding down the highway. We're getting into traffic jams and I'm just, I'm shitting a brick. We finally get to the off ramp. We get to the guy's house. We wheel and we deal. I haggled with him and I could only go so high and he could only go so low and I didn't buy the car. And we left. And Vern, uh, we got outside and Vern says, well, what happened? And I said, he wanted this much and I could only spend this much. And Vern says, well, I'll buy those wheels, those, those uh, Halibrand mags, I'll buy those wheels off you for a thousand bucks. Now you can get the car. So we turn, turn around, knock on the door and a deal is struck, so. Well, what, what really got me in the hot rods was uh, where I grew up. I grew up on the border of, uh, of Boston and uh, I used to actually see old hot rods uh, driving up and down Route 9. My old man used to tell me about you know, his old cars. My neighbor was in the cars. And uh, once I got into high school, one of the maintenance men there had a clone of the ZZ Top car, the three window. And I used to see this thing every day driving around the high school. And he also had a 50 Merc, which I thought was super cool. Oh, that was, oh, that was like 102. Tony comes in, he's all pissed off.
when I met my wife, her dad was a huge hot rodder, you know, going back to the 50s in, in uh, New England, he was a nomad. You know, I met her and I got to see all these old photos of her dad's car, the 32 Roadster that the nomads used to race and, you know, they'd go up and down Com Ave and just drive it around in their cars. I think that's what really brought me from the 50s customs back to the early hot rods. Every car I got, you know, it just, it was, it ended up being a couple years older, a couple years older, and then, you know, when I built my Chevy, which I don't have anymore, my coupe, I was still, I was, you know, still pretty young, and uh, didn't have much money, and kind of set a cap as, you know, three grand to build the car. I never really thought I would ever own a 30, a 30s, uh, a post 31 car because there's so much money. The story with this car is I actually did some work for a guy on his 32 5 window. He bought this uh, 32 on eBay, trailered it up here one winter, and on his way up the car broke in half on the trailer. The doors were actually, they had the roof split and the, and, the, and the sub rails broke, so the doors were on the trailer when he came here. I did a bunch of work on it. You know, he wanted to build a, a quick, cheap rat rod. I reinforced the whole car. Couldn't pay me. He said he didn't have the money. So I said, well, you're not taking your 32 until I get something. So he showed up with a Model A five window coupe body and a shit box of a 33 three window body. So I decided to uh, to build it. I ended up throwing that entire body away and ended up just really scouring from east coast to west coast for parts. Well, uh, for a long time I've been a custom guy. I had a, uh, uh, my first car was a uh, 51 shoebox and then uh, I finally got my 41 Ford. Nice stock, uh, uh, super deluxe. But never had a hot rod and uh, we were, we were always going to the uh, uh, March meet and uh, the hot rod reunion in Bakersfield. And uh, they, they got a pretty good swap meet there. This car was for sale there when a bunch of parts had come out of an estate sale. A father and son had both died within six months. Uh, ironically, not far from where I lived. The gentleman that owned my car, a guy by the name of Bart, was killed. He was frail and he was, he was killed. He climbed out of his truck to put a letter in the mailbox and he was run over by his own truck. So the mother, the, the father died of old age, Bart the son died by being run over by his vehicle. She wanted to sell all the stuff. Short story long, I get this car. The roof insert was filled, but it was just a sheet over the whole hole. So I was in my driveway a month after I owned the car grinding out this hole. I just looked up in the rafters and as corny as it sounds, I said, as corny as it sounds, I said, you know Bart, I'm gonna finish your car. I'm gonna, the car's gonna be on the road, it's gonna see it's gonna see mileage. And an old timer walking his dog that I know says, that's a neat car you got there. I said, yeah, I got it from this guy. His name was Bart, he passed away. He says, it wasn't Bart Minutella, was it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, it was. He says, well, I, uh, I, he, was, he, he learned how to do sheet metal work under me. He was an, uh, he's an apprentice, I was his apprentice. I don't know, it sounds corny, but it was, it was kind of eerie that I'm thinking, yeah, what are you telling me? Go for it and finish your car? Finish, finish it right for me? I don't know.
guys around a little before I ever met them. As I was going to those, those Rat Fink reunion Christmas parties at uh, Kim Dedick's sign shop. Roth was having those parties then. Well, it's just a bunch of guys um, in the early period cars and uh, customs. Yeah, the, the guys in the club I met uh, probably in the, like in the mid, late 80s. I'd see one or two of them at a different swap meet or a show. And I could see they were looking for the same kind of stuff I was at the swap meets. And Somebody, somebody really stood out if you know they were into something like this at that time. So it kind of was just a natural kind of progression. Seeing cool guys and competition almost for, for parts where there wasn't much competition then. Nobody really was looking for the old stuff. But we even liked old model kits, collected stuff like that, uh, hot rods. So I'd see them here and there, and then, uh, but it was really, I think, the Rat Fink parties that kind of brought us together, where I was, I'd see them there and think, wow, those guys all know each other, you know, and they all seem really cool guys and the same kind of stuff. And then uh, the other guys, like Vern, I met, we'd just see him at swap meets and collectible toy shows and stuff, and it was just, you know, it was like, who's that guy that's like my age that's going after the same stuff as me? But it was, you know, it's kind of, we didn't talk for like a year probably, we'd see him, but it was like mysterious in the night. I met him at a, I met Vern at a Floyd Clymer auction. That was the first time, you know, I told him I had a 32-4, and I don't think he really believed that I had my car, but we were both, you know, going for like the same magazines and the same, you know, there was all kinds of, you know, but it was just like a big pile of like small, small size 50s magazines we were thumbing through. I just came across a t-shirt that we were going as a group going to Rat Fink reunions in San Francisco in 92. Sandy, it's do-it-yourself deal, it's silkscreen shirts that said, um, you know, uh, road trip to uh, San Francisco Fink party. And we, we have a real deep background in Roth, um, the Roth uh, reunions. That um, was the pre-moon party. and uh, Robert Williams and his wife Suzanne started this Rat Fink party that was kind of the predecessor, I think to all these custom culture shows there are now. Every state, you know, every country, it seems like, has a hot rod shows that are kind of, I think the nucleus was the Rat Fink Party. But I, I went to a few of those and saw, like, Sandy and Fish, and uh, uh, didn't know who they were, and, and uh, you know, they're running around with these kooky shirts they made, and then, uh, Yep, I've known Vern probably a little over 15 years, 17 years. Uh, fish I've known since my first year of college, over 20 years. First person I ever went to a red fish party was me and Fish. Each year they do it around Christmas. And uh, when I started going like the late 80s, it was at a sign shop down in Foley Tent. That's where I'd, I'd see those guys there and they'd be dressed up a lot of times. Like, uh, you know, I remember one year they had all these rat finks with, chains and they painted gold, you know, kind of like a run DMC kind of thing. I thought, oh, that's funny. Uh, spray painted gold rat fink uh, model kits on, on chains. It just They would always come up with some goofy theme and uh, I would just be like, wow, who, who are these guys? Nobody I knew was into stuff like that, you know.
apparently this came from the same spot Keith got had a Model A truck. Did fish get something? Because fish had this body, but it was bent around a tree or something. Yeah, the quarter panels were all just fucked up, and then this whole piece was just missing. Like they cut it out to put a pickup bed mm -hmm. in the back. So this is actually spliced in from a sport cube, which is the same sort of panel. I just started doing that. It needs a lot more work to get everything aligned. Nice doors, nice deck lid, but I haven't really started the body work. I got my uh, 56 Ford pickup 15 years ago, I think. I remember at Paso Robles, there was a magenta Shopton Channel pickup okay. that really kind of set me off. And then I remembered, wow, Vern's got this 56 Shopton pickup that he's not doing anything with. So I, I asked him, hey, you want to sell this thing? And he said, yeah, I'll sell it. Boom, it was on. I started, I got into cars uh, first through my father who was uh, uh, restoring a 62 Galaxy when I was uh, probably 13, something like that. Sure, it's a Model A Roadster pickup, uh, 28, 29. It actually started out as Jim's project, but um, he found a 32 pickup and wanted to build that first, so I talked him out of the Model A body, and I got a 32 frame. It's an original frame, but it's actually a couple pieces. I had a couple of junk frames, and I had to, you know, splice it together to make one good one. Just, you know, when I first got it, it was just a rolling chassis and no motor, and, and it was owned by a guy named Nick Nicholson. He had a whole bunch of cars, and um, I guess this used to be a, a show car and a racer, and it was at the Pan Pacific in the 50s. He just accumulated all these cars, and then, um, when I found it about 15 years ago, uh, it was in this whole collection. This guy wanted to buy a 40 convertible, but he had to buy all of this guy's lot of cars. And he had all kinds of hot rods, and this was one of them. And I'd work with him in the garage uh, on and off, helping out when I could. And uh, when I got a little older and it got time for me to get a car, we looked around and found a 56 Chevy sitting in a field. and. Uh, I uh, bought it for 800 bucks and brought it home and we restored it together. Uh, worked on that for a few years. I had it for about six years, I think. Built a couple of uh, other 55, 6 Chevys. Uh, after I met Pete, got into a little bit more old stuff, uh, more of the hot rod type of thing. He was building a 31 Chevy at the time and I still had my 56. It was sort of like a 60s kind of street machine type of deal. and. Uh, I really dug that coupe that he was building, so uh, I went out and I got a, a 31 Model A Roadster, and that was the first hot rod I built. Now plug in the big battery chargers. No, just unplug the little one. All right. It doesn't look good. I did blow up in Bakersfield, come back from, uh, I think it was March meets. We were leaving the hotel and I said, yeah, I kind of have to, I want to get back. So I left, it was like midnight or so. I said, that's only a two hour drive to LA. Got about 40 minutes down the freeway. Temperature just shot up to like 250. Oil pressure went to nothing. It just started knocking and it was just boom. Just pretty much seized. Looking around and it's like no one, no one around, no cell phone. You know, I remember seeing a gas station or a call box, it was pitch black, and walked back to the gas station, got a tow truck. It's got a Halibrand rear end, quick change. Um, it wasn't too hard finding, you know, finding stuff to swap me at the Roadster show, and um, just scavenging, you know, all over. And you meet a lot of good friends that way, you know, and talk to people, and. You learn a lot of stuff when you're building it, especially the old stuff.
much we're a group of guys that are basically our common thread is that we all want to build a traditional hot rod that and or custom that would be period within like say a 10 year time period so if you you know if you've got a car you want to try to keep your parts like five years prior or five years after you need to build your own car you need to you know have something to do with the way your car has evolved you know you can't just buy a car turn the key and you know hang a plaque on it I mean that's just to me is not really all that cool you know you know we have a certain type of car that we like we're obviously into the early style stuff um, mostly it's not a car club it's not the type of car club that's looking to get more members you know what I mean we've got a core group of guys and uh, um, well I think it's more of a at least to me it's a style thing where we like things very clean and simple kind of understated early nostalgia style friendship comes first before even the cars do uh, you know sometimes people will ask if we're you know recruiting for members and and that's not really the way we do it it's just if there are you know no you know we get guys that come up to us at a car show sometimes and they're like how do I get into the car club or you know I'm thinking about joining your car club and it's you got to try and explain to these guys that uh, we don't have the kind of car club that you can join you know what I mean you have we have the kind of car club that you're asked to join or you're invited to join and uh, we all had something in common where we wanted older cars and we were all the same age group uh, I don't think it was ever a principle I don't think we we're ever trying to set any standards or nothing I looked at it that way it's not about being, it's not about going to a car show you know where you sit there and you have your matching jacket and your matching umbrella and your matching chair and sit back and guard your car that's not what it's all about you know it's, it's a whole different level of of enjoying a, a hot rod so that you'd see in the the cars that were built in like the 80s I mean I guess the, the thing is is that like all of us you know have been in the cars for a long time but there was such you know for me anyways there was a real disconnect with the uh, with the hot rod community in general because you know every car you see looks like ZZ Top Eliminator you know it's fucking hundred and twenty thousand dollar car and uh, you know it's got a 600 horsepower crate motor and it's got leather interior and all this other shit and you're like you know dude I may as well try and get a ride to the moon man I ain't fucking ever riding in that thing the overall look has to be at that early time period like late 40s up through the late 50s you know everybody in the club is, is, is mechanically inclined they come from a mechanical background you know a blue collar background you know Jared's a union carpenter you know, I do heating and air conditioning, you know, Jim now, ah, Jim's not a hands-on guy anymore. He sits behind a desk, but he used to be.
been looking for a 34-3 window. You know, there's none like that on the road that I'd seen. I wanted to do a Dry Lakes really hammered roof, uh, like, you know, Pearson Brothers. My favorite car was Bob Rumwaite's car, a 69D coupe. So my ideal hot rod was that car. I'd seen a couple bodies that I was interested in, and then I was down in San Diego at the Big Three, and this one came up. A uh, guy, Buck, and his son had it down there, but they had found it. It had been parked in Port Wainimi, California, since late 40s, and not, not driven since then. So it was perfect candidate to hot rod. It had full fenders, mechanical brakes, they rebuilt the engine. Uh, I hot rodded it, but speed equipment, chopped it driving it since then. The yeah, car has a flathead 24 stud, like a 1940 motor, has a Schneider ground cam. Edmunds head, Sharp 4 intake, has four Stromberg's on it. You know, different parts I found at different swap meets. Chrome Stromberg's here and there. A beehive oil cleaner, Sandy found in a trash can in an alley. He gave it to me, that's, that's pretty cool. Sticking out of a trash can of all things, he walks by. And he's, he found it. Um, has Electroline headlights, which were pretty, pretty rare, unique, you know, deco style headlights. I just, I thought they went perfect on the deco lines style of the car. And it has 40 rims all around, 16 by fours, got Firestone tires, got a 40 dash I put in it, uh, like a sprint car steering wheel, an old uh, Bell style wheel. At Eric Vaughn, Louver the deck lid, their Pontiac tail lights, 40 brakes all around, dropped axle, dropped and drilled. It's uh, like a late, you know, 47, 48 style hot rod, lakes car. Re you know, exactly the way I wanted it. So it's kind of a dream car to have for me. Like I said, that's, to me, that's the fun of it. You can go to swap meets, you can buy parts, um, but I like going and finding stuff. We live, I live in an agricultural area. This stuff is an abundant supply of parts. You just gotta search them out. And people are generally more than happy to get rid of them because it's just junk. So um, everything on it's traditional, you know, early stuff that I've found in the woods or that I've collected over the years. Um, the brake drums on the front actually did come out of a chassis that I found up the street from my house about a mile. Um, it was on a 37 truck chassis that someone had converted over to juice brakes. That's, that's how I find a lot of the stuff. But it is, it is possible to build a car out of stuff like this. I mean, if you keep finding the same bodies and getting the right pieces, you can. that's what Pete Flavin's 33 is all about. It's all pieces that he found or bought and made a car out of basically nothing. Right. Sex!
much time for me back when I was probably three or four years old. Uh, my grandfather was into restoring Model A's, Model T's, and I started going to a lot of shows. They take me around in the Rumble Seat or in the Roadster in the middle between them. And in fact, I own one of the cars now, and my parents own one of the other ones. So that kind of got me started. And then once I got to high school, I decided I couldn't drive a regular car, so I started with a 55 F100. And then I, when I graduated, the day I graduated, I traded the F100 for my 55 Ford that I have now. And uh, I've had that car ever since I was 17. That was what I learned to do body work and paint on. Um, a friend of mine offered me a, a job and I started taking cars apart. And that was my, my first experience with it as far as doing it professionally. And then he worked me into body and paint and it kind of took off from there. And that car was basically my learning project. At nighttime after work, I'd work on that. And I'd learn how to straighten panels and, and uh, then into the paint process. And the car's been painted many times now. It's, I, it's a, that car's been an evolving car. I consider it done now. Um, because I, you can only work on so many cars at one time, so. And then I got into a whole bunch of other cars in between and a lot of projects that never got finished. And then I got the Cadillac, did a chop on it, it was received pretty well. A lot of people thought it was a pretty cool car because it was very different with a heavy chop. And then I decided I had to have open wheels, so the Caddy had to go. I've basically been a custom guy up until recently. I decided I, I need to break that trend and uh, I'd always wanted to get into a hot rod and, and uh, had the opportunity. So about a week before our car show, which was back in September, I um, decided that I needed to try to get, get it going better. So we, um, I trailed it down to Massachusetts to our club shop, um, tried a couple more things with a different flywheel that didn't work out. So the next day, um, my buddy Pete and I went to his barn. He said he had a 364 nail head. It was in pieces. So we went over there, picked it up. We actually dropped it, smashed the oil pan, which was a good time. And uh, we had to hammer that all out, fix it. Um, then we changed the flywheel off from the 401, put it on it, and we're pretty sure that was the problem, was a flywheel issue. Um, so that, that day we actually took the motor, completely, finished taking the motor apart the rest of the way, cleaned it, made sure everything was good, and we determined it was pretty good shape, so we put it back together, and that night we had the car running again, um, just rough. We had a lot of stuff we had left to do. And then over the, the following week, I made the trek down there, um, I believe it was two times, and then had drove to the show on Saturday. So, it's Saturday morning, I was still working on it, trying to get stuff squared away, like bolting the seat down and all that stuff. So, we were just talking about that. Um, it's it's general knowledge that the club was initially called the Chislers. Um, Chislers were around for probably about five years, and uh, just kind of got out of hand because half people were into mo motorcycles and stuff. So. We just kind of got hardcore in the hot rods, and and there was a uh, not even a falling out, but a splitting up of uh, some of the members. So at a certain point, we decided to rename the club the Choppers, the Burbank Choppers, and uh, just wanted to kind of do our own thing. So we split and we started the Choppers. It was kind of like just a group of friends that liked the same things: old cars, punk rock, skateboards. We were all skaters back then, and kind of evolved into 
more of a car thing. We started, every, everyone started building cars, real neat stuff, and we just got real serious about it. And people started noticing, and it kind of came to a time where other guys didn't really want to keep going with the car thing. They just wanted to keep it a little low key, kind of social club. And didn't want to hurt our friends' feelings, so we just kind of broke up, broke that up. Said, you know, we're just going to start a car club. And you know we're just gonna go in a, another direction. And then the choppers, I I, I lose track of. What, I'm gonna say mid to late '90s, the name got changed. But we've been a group of friends post college, um, you know, since I'd say '89, '90, and uh, been driving together and going to everything. So we went to like the first ten Viva Las Vegas. Some things we just haven't been going to lately, but. We've been going to Paso forever, and then it was in the late '80s, and I really can't remember what year. It was like, you know, anything anywhere from '87 to '89. I don't know. And uh, finally, I started got a job at Warner Brothers Animation, and I started working with John Fisher, and uh, found out that he knew all these guys, and they all were into cars, and they all wanted to build hot rods, and uh, uh, only one of them had a hot rod then. It was Aaron, Aaron K. N. had his had his deuce already. And uh, went over to their little clubhouse they, a few of them lived at, and uh, Aaron's Deuce was out front, and it was kind of breaking all the laws of nature that I was aware of that, that someone that age was driving a car like that, and that it actually worked, you know, and he could go somewhere, and it was just blowing my mind. But, uh, because I kind of grew up around old cars that just, uh, just sat around, and you tinkered with them, and then, you know, you drive it a block and then you'd have to push it home, you know. car back and then I think he had some problem with his wife and then the car ended up in Pasadena and then when I got it, it had fiberglass fenders and uh, the, the, the guy that owned it 
put on, uh, took the fenders off, I had perfect steel fenders and he took them off and put them on a deuced roadster. And the guy I got it from, you know, he has a lot of really neat cars, he owns the Tom Pollard roadster. And his son was going to drive my car to high school and then they couldn't get it to steer right. And I don't know, they have like 15 really bitching cars and for some reason they let this go. But they, you know, they love what I've done to it because that's what the, they would have done to it. But I think it makes them a little sick every time they see it because, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like what they want to do with it. And that was, it's named after like a, one of the old Roth decals. Bad news. Bad news travels fast. <laughs> this car I've had since uh, I was five. My, uh, my grandfather found the body. So basically my, my grandfather got it for free, but he paid $50 to have it delivered to our house. And my, my dad, who has a 24T, yeah, which was built in 59, I, he started in the late 50s and was finished in 64. You know, he kind of thought like, oh, you know, it's too rough. Um, and so anyway, I got it and then for years, you know, it was just in our backyard and we played, you know, all my friends, we played in it. And, and then um, the club got approached to do the show Rides about four years ago, an uh, episode of that. So we decided to build it. But the one thing that was cool, we, we raised the cowl like one and a half inches. So this would uh, match up. A lot of people just like a little. It, it always looks strange to me how like if you see on a tee the the cow is lower, so the windshield from the front stays down more. But you know we just really wanted to make it look like a hot rod that was built in like the early '60s. You know, so you know everybody in the club you know put a lot of time in it and uh, took off work. It was crazy. It went from just a bunch of parts to a driving car in about two months, a little over two months, to what it is now. My 50 Ford, my dad bought it uh, in the early 80s and he was driving it to work for a little while until it, I don't know, wouldn't start or something, I don't really remember, but um, you know, we were both really always into customs and so he thought, oh, let's chop it, you know, so we started pulling it all apart and he cut the roof off and then uh, 
just clamped the A pillars and, and it just sat around like that for about a year. And then uh, I was uh, taking some classes at up at Art Center as a high school student and um, there was this guy that had a Volkswagen. I saw it before and then like over the little break between semesters he had chopped it himself. And I was like, wow, if I, well, if that guy can do it, then, you know, I can do it. So my dad had a welder and he had some, you know, cut off wheels and stuff. So I just started, started going on it and he did, didn't know anything and kind of made a mess. But I, you know, a lot of stuff got fixed later. Tried to make it look like my drawings I'd done of it. So, um. Yeah, that's an easy one. Actually, my father said I couldn't have a fucking car. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hate to say that, but. Yeah, no, he said I couldn't have a car, um, or he didn't want me to have a car, is what it really came down to. Um, I did find out why later. Uh, he was a wild man, um, and uh, yeah, I ended up being pretty much the same, uh, but not blatantly obvious as he had done, I guess. Uh, he was more of a motorcycle guy, too. He wasn't a car guy. But uh, yeah, so anyways, I got this first car, and of course it sucked, because nobody gave me money to help me pay for one, and uh, it always broke. So I was always fixing it, and uh, I was a sucker for working on stuff like that already, and it, it just kind of went from there. Yeah, you know, the senior year of high school, I finally had a decent car, and I pissed a lot of rich kids off, and I got a real kick out of that. That was a lot of fun. Well, I wanted a hot rod, because I had gone up to San Francisco and uh, in like 92, and, and uh, stayed with a friend of a friend up there. Uh, um, one of the guys, old, older brother, had a had a Model A coupe, and, and uh, on deuce rails with a Chevy. And uh, at the time, I thought you had to have a hot rod shop build a hot rod. And uh, I was, I was like, well, where did this car come from? Oh, we just welded stuff together and put an engine in, it and you know, now and then and he just used it for his an everyday car. You know, and while I was there, he just took off down the street burning rubber he's gonna go off to a bar you know and I, I just never seen an old car used that way you know I didn't, didn't know it was possible that you could do that yourself and everything so I kinda like the top chop again I, I led you know I was led by example I went home and you know thought, okay I can do this and you know I, it's not just something that an expert has to do for you so you know yeah that, the first one was just so rough it was never gonna be you know, it's just like getting older, things evolve. I want an old car, like a legit. And uh, so, yeah, just I gave up working on that one. And uh, I started piecing together the uh, 27. And a uh, buddy of mine actually had the body. Uh, he ended up having terminal cancer. And I bought it off of him uh, shortly before he passed away. And uh, it came with the chassis, it came with a deuce heavy beam and a deuce rear end. And that was, that's where I started with that. I really just thought, I'm gonna build a Model A coupe on a Model A frame and put a Chevy in it, because that's the easiest thing. And, um, but I kept getting better stuff. You know, I, I just, I'd be looking, somebody had a Deuce chassis for sale with a flathead in it, and it was really cheap. And then, uh, still looking for a body, and then somebody had a Roadster body, and it just it was like, wow, I guess, I guess I'm building a Roadster, so. You know, I mailed the front axle out, the more drop. I started spending a lot of, a lot of time talking to crazy old men. I guess the Beatles, you know, and they just, they're the only ones that actually played with the stuff when it was around. So they're the only ones that really know. I mean, you can only read so many damn books. Just uh, kind of word of mouth. Most of the stuff, I, I hardly ever go to the swap meet, really. Most of the stuff is just, somebody tells me about their friend has some stuff, and I go to their house, and they know someone else, and it just becomes this treasure, treasure hunt, you know, and... Most of the stuff I got that way, you know.
I used to, uh, I was always into motorcycles and stuff. I've always, you know, I've been riding motorcycles a long time and then uh, once I uh, started getting into cars, a lot of my buddies down here were, like Jimmy, Jimmy was always, uh, he was always into earlier stuff, 55s and that kind of thing. They basically kind of lit the fire on me, getting interested in it. And I started off with like, uh, you know, some early 50 Chevys and uh, found a 40 Ford that was, uh, had been sitting in a barn for like 30 years. I don't know, something about motorcycles translating better into hot rods than other cars and then going for my first ride in a roadster, it just blew my mind. I wanted a Model A body. Originally I wanted a 28-29 and uh, it was going to be on deuce rails with an Oldsmobile motor. You know, not a Chevrolet motor with Oldsmobile valve covers, but an Oldsmobile motor. And uh, Jimmy used to have a 31 Model A and he sold it and I think he sort of regretted selling it and then he bought a body so he could uh, rebuild the car later on. Well, the, the body was hanging up on the wall in the shop in about a dozen different pieces, you know? And uh, I had been talking about building a car long enough that he basically said, why don't you just buy the fucking roadster that's hanging up in the wall in the garage and be done with it? It's a classic case of like an impulsive decision sort of defining the next two and a half, three years of your life. This is the first car I've ever built starting with nothing and putting it together piece by piece by piece. And then the next thing you know, I spend every single night and all weekend, every weekend, building this car. And uh, I think I sort of didn't really realize what I was getting myself into when I started because like I said, I started, I always started with cars. You know, I had a 53 and I fuck around with it some and chop the top and lower it and whatever. And then I found a 40 Ford sedan and I put a motor in it, but the car was all there, you know what I mean? It just needed to be updated and, and gotten back on the road. But this car, I, uh, I literally started with nothing, you know what I mean? And to boot, I had no idea what I was doing. So I knew I wanted a, a Model A on a deuce frame, but I've never built a frame before. So I, uh, you know, I got the rails. Again, I got the rails from Chicky Brignolo, same guy I got the front end from. And uh, started putting it together, and I guess, uh, you know, it's taken forever, you know what I mean? I, I, I spent, uh, I've got probably thousands of hours into this thing now, you know? You do things, they're not right, you redo them. I mean, I've made five column drops for this car, and uh, I redid my pedal assembly at least four different times. And uh, while you work on this thing endlessly, and your wife is like, what happened to you? And you cut out from work early to come down here just so you can sit there and stare at something that you don't know how to do and uh, building a car starting from nothing is totally different than taking a car that's already built and modifying it to suit your needs you know this car I started off like I said with nothing so it's interesting how you you get started on stuff like this and maybe you don't know that much about it or you know like I had enthusiasm and I knew what I wanted it to look like but I didn't really know how everything worked and and uh, you know somebody somebody like uh, my friend Lynn you know takes takes me under his wing and kind of shows me how things work and as we he pretty much built this and I had helped him just do stuff and 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 uh, learned enough that you know a couple years later I built built another car all by myself so you know, I guess that's that's the way it works. You start out dumb and get some help, and then then pretty soon you're the expert. <laughs>